We're not doing the camera, sir. What's that? We're only doing slides, no camera, so I guess it's okay. easier. That's now making it easier. Slavic, can you see your screen? I can see a uh, static. Now do you see more? Playback on other website has been disabled by the video home. What does it mean? Sure. No, that's all right. Thank you. That is really bizarre. Okay. Can you see it now? I don't see anything. Maybe I need to Do you log in? Okay, I hear you. You hear me? You don't see it? Oh, here both. Sorry. So it's a delay. So it is a delay. Okay, good. So I stopped screen sharing. So I should start. And I just want to make sure you see the. Good. Yes. Perfect. All right, one more thing, and then we're going. There's one viewer. All right, guys, thank you for coming. Uh, before we kickstart, uh, I'm uh, Rishi. I'm co-founder of Demistro. There's other Demistro team members, Slavika, CEO, Erika, others. Uh, we are a security automation and collaboration platform for security operations, and we do these meetups monthly. Uh, today, we have uh, Calvin as the speaker. and. Uh, the way we connected was we connected on our uh, incident response community, which we have created. And uh, I would like you to guys join us as well. It's on our website, demistro.com slash community. It's an open community, discussions about all kinds of incident response and forensics topics. And then we met with Calvin, came to our office, and uh, he has an amazing story. So this whole originated from his experience and love the story so much, I says you should tell it to others. And here we are. So I think I'll leave it at that towards the end uh, for some of the new folks here. We'll do a demo of the Demistro platform if you guys are interested to stay back. But this is more about uh, Calvin and his experiences. I think the only other thing I would say is uh, we want to encourage this community. So tell your friends, invite them. We want to keep the incident response and learnings there and exchange more of them. With that, Kelvin, go for it. It's free pizza and beers. So. It's free pizza and beers. <laughs> and, and I just want to add, I mean, the, the uh, Slack that Rich is talking about, there's a lot yeah. of great stuff there, a lot of great community. Yeah. Uh, the Mistos also compiled a really nice list of tools for people that are new, that are looking to see, you know, what, what options are out there. And looks like a broadcast is... Or it's not down, it's just not sharing. It's not sharing, so let's try the share again. It's getting there. Hopefully the broadcast will work. Okay, good, it's delayed. It's delayed is okay. Because we record this for future playing as well, guys. So. Okay, so Slavic, just let me know when uh, when if I'm moving too fast. All right. Okay. <laughs> now it will be streaming, so it'll be okay. Okay. So yeah, again, the whole purpose of this was for me to present a, a, my actual experience at a customer site, uh, talking specifically about civil and uh, the civil and criminal investigation side of incident response. Okay. So this this particular incident, we codenamed it Key Keystone Cops, and you'll see why in just a minute. So for those who aren't familiar, all right, just a quick. Uh, definition. Now, who actually here does digital forensics? Anyone else? No. Well, I mean, digital forensics isn't rocket science, right? It's it's basically it's hard, so. yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> investigating digital media to see what's going on, right? Getting information out of it. And of course, e-discovery is the aspect where we're actually looking to pull evidence out for civil or criminal prosecution purposes. Okay. Why is this distinction important? Well, anybody can do digital forensics, right? You look at a log file, you 
pull up and look at cookies, that's digital forensics. However, if you're not being careful, you can taint the evidence for actual e-discovery. So if your purpose is to sue somebody or protect yourself from being sued, if your purpose is to put someone in jail, then being uncareful when you're doing digital forensics means you can destroy your e-discovery output. Okay? So obviously if you're you know, looking for an insider, if you are talking about uh, you know, lawsuits over IP, all of these areas are, are where you need, to, you need to really be careful and think about what you do before you start uh, engaging in digital forensics. So, tools. Now, if you don't do digital forensics, you're probably not familiar. The standard for the tool set is a piece of hardware called a write block. Right? It's essentially where we're pulling out the hard drives of whatever media it is, a PC, laptop, whatever. The write blocker ensures that the data that's pulled out is not changed in any way. The data is then copied over into, uh, ideally, a, a separate piece of hardware that contains the entire image. But strictly speaking, you don't have to have that. All right, the main thing is that you can demonstrate that the image pulled off of the original media is the same as what was there and has not tampered in some way. Okay. Standard tools for that include hashing, like MD5, SHA1, and so on and so forth. Once you pull the image out, then you run different tools on it. Right? So these are some of the industry standard tools that are out there. There are many more that are not mentioned. There are network versions, etc., etc. But the basic idea is that these tools will go through and do a lot of the work that you need to pull information out. Whether it's something as simple as undeleting files that have been deleted, all the way up to things like pulling out uh, remnants from Facebook posts or uh, encrypted WhatsApp uh, message databases. So, criteria for digital evidence. It's basically the same as for physical evidence, right? So, law enforcement, you know, but essentially, number one, you have to have chain of custody, okay? You need to show that the evidence from where it started to where path that gets to court is, is not in some way uh, taking a detour that the defense can go and say, oh, you did something with it. Second part is you have to have proper investigation technique. Right? So chain of custody, it's as simple as a form. I actually have a copy here for, this is our Ventura one. It's literally a piece of paper. So it's not rocket science, but the purpose of the chain of custody form is just to say this is where it came from, this is who's responsible for it, this is what's in it, so on and so forth. So of course, part of the chain of custody is you have to have a proper strategy, you have to have documentation, you have to have acquisition for both, or, or, or doc, an execution to acquire the data, to store the data, to process the data. Investigative techniques. There's a lot of variations, right? There's no one correct answer. And the reason is because what you're looking to do, the environment you're working in, changes all the time, right? But in general, document everything. Whatever you do, no matter how small, make sure you, you make a note of what was there before, what you're doing to it, and what the output is going to be. Number two, you need to be prepared, right? What are your goals as an investigator? It's not everything, right? Rarely is everything. What is the scope of your investigation? Your customer will generally dictate, or the situation will dictate how far you're willing to go, how far you need to go, and the points where you shouldn't be going. What is the hardware and software environment, right? Surprisingly, the customer doesn't necessarily know. So you need to, you need to know what's there. What is the hardware they're using? What is the software they're using? So on and so forth. And of course, what is your investigation plan and what is your schedule for? Right? These, these deals are never open-ended. You usually have some particular time frame goal you're working towards. Uh, and so you need to have an idea of you know, what you're, how you're going to get to that point. And then, of course, when you do the actual deployment, do you have the right people? Do they have the right skills? Do you have an investigation flow that's, that you've used before and is proven? Do you have the tools on site that can get you what you need to do? Right? I, I showed a bunch of tools up there. The reason there's so many different tools is because, number one, there's a lot of different environments, and number two, you may not necessarily get everything you need from any one tool. Right? Magnet Forensics, for example, is really good on the social media stuff. Uh, NCASE is more on a traditional, uh, well-understood, standard tool that everybody uses. Okay? So, uh, one question, Kevin. Sure. So, you, you showed us the paper trail of kind of chain of custody, but you also mentioned documentation, which is what are you going to do with it and what is the output? Is there a standard templates there, or you guys just take, take a Evernote or whatever choice? So, the short answer is uh, there is not a legal standard per se. Okay. For us as a company, we have our standard templates. Uh, but, you know, there's not like some industry standard that says this is the only way to do it. And then how do you collab, like two people doing the same thing, 
Do you use like a Google Docs to share what you're doing, or do you email it back and forth? What do you do? So the short answer is that uh, we do all of that. We, okay. we do messaging, we do Google Docs, we do all of that, which is why something like this is be very useful. Right. At the end of the day, having a common platform, platform makes it easier to ensure that things aren't missed or dropped. But uh, of course, for us, we're mature, so we you know yeah, we yeah. do that. But when we bring new people in, it's definitely a problem. Yes. Do you ever like take photos while you're? Absolutely, that's part of documentation, right? So one of the first things we do when we get evidence in, for example, is we put all the hard drives and take a picture of it. Right? <laughs> it sounds really simple, but it's documenting what you're. Doing. You would be surprised. Okay, you'd be surprised how, and, and you'll see in a little a little bit why we do this. <laughs> he's laughing because he's seen this already. <laughs> So, so as a note, I mean, as we all know, right, we're in the technology side. Digital evidence has some fundamental differences versus physical evidence, right? The lot of flow we see today has a very clear lineage from the physical evidence side. But the reality is that digital evidence, you can copy it, you can transport it, you can back it up, you can do all kinds of stuff to it, and do integrity checks, which you can't do with physical evidence. Right? Knife with blood on it is a knife with blood on it. You can't really do much with it except put it in the drawer. Right? An image you can put anywhere in the world through the internet. Right, and preserve integrity through you know, hash checks. So what we're seeing is that uh, this, this is, process is slow, but over time we do, we as a company expect that there will be some type of automated chain of custody. Maybe blockchain, maybe something else. But something is gonna come along and start changing this very ad hoc approach that exists today. All right, so let's talk about the situation. The customer is a global 500 company. So actually an old school business, but it's actually very IP heavy. The customer was attacked in a month long campaign. So what happened was they were getting email threats against their executives and their employees. A WordPress blog site was, was created and used to leak internal documents. And in addition, a Twitter account was being used to direct attention to the leaked documents. Okay, pretty serious. I mean, we're talking CEO's job is in danger here. So we were actually the third vendor brought on site, okay? So this is, a, this is kind of an interesting situation, but essentially the first vendor was a big four consultancy. Okay? I'm not gonna say who, but it was, it's a big one. Uh, they deployed 10 of their consultants on site for incident response for over a year. Wow. The second vendor was a top 10 local consultancy in Brazil. I think Booz, Booz Hamilton, but in Brazil. And they were basically charged with doing ongoing cyber threat intelligence to, to make sure there weren't additional leaks uh, basically to monitor the situation to see that this didn't recur. Okay? And of course, what we were brought in for was actually e-discovery. Right? They had actually grabbed a guy, arrested him, threw him in jail, and now they were preparing a legal case, so they asked us to come in and do all that documentation. All right, the calm before the storm. So we go in, we think, hey, pretty straightforward, right? We've got some data, we've got to pull it out, we've got to package it, all good. <laughs> So, we were tasked to investigate and prepare the evidence set collected. It was two laptops, two external hard drives, nine flash thumb drives from suspects to be correlated versus the evidence gathered by the vendors one and two. Okay. Well, look, here's the first problem. We reviewed the evidence there. We see that the suspect in the data did not have hardly any of, any of the leaked data. So, this is a problem because this guy was one of those free IP guys, right? One of those guys where every piece of data he ever touches he copies. So we wound up finding over 350,000 files. This is excluding system and everything. This is actual IP. 350,000 files that this guy had copied into his personal data, right? So when we say that this data is not included here, it means something. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly an example of improper access, but since these you know, literally uh, one or two of these 350,000 files were once leaked, it seems, seems very, very unlikely that this is the guy who did it. Right now, of course, there is a caveat. Um, one of these laptops were encrypted via VeraCrypt. And the guy's an IT guy. So we know he's got a 10, 12 digit password. And we did some work there, which we'll talk, I'll talk offline about, right? But, you know, we can't say for 100% certain because at least some of the data was in his primary laptop. Okay, so it's possible. But, of course, you know, since we have this question mark now over whether or not this guy is really the one that was responsible, we will go to the customer and say, look, we really need to look at this a little closer. The smoking gun's not there. If you want us to package what we have, we'll do it. But, you know, if you want us to do a good job, we should go back and look at the rest of the evidence. 
So we essentially get the investigation expanded to review the customer's internal data. Right? So when this incident happened, they went out and they acquired 33 of their internal machines. Right? Because, of course, they immediately suspected insider of doing this. And so the problems begin, okay? which is what we're here for. Something rotten in the state of Denmark, or Brazil. Uh, specifically, of the internal work computers acquired by Vendor One, the big four consultancy, 33 images. Three were held back. These were senior level executives. They didn't want us to see it. No problem. Six could not be found. Okay? Six images of internal engineering people, IP people, they lost it. Not good. Um, of the actual 24 image that, images that we did receive, okay, so I'm here I am, I'm, I've got this big, literal, big duffel bag full of hard drives. I'm checking in, checking them in through chain of custody. The first six that I inventory, three of them show discrepancies between the plastic bubble wrap around the hard drive, the label on that, versus the actual serial, um, uh, the label with the serial number on the hard drive itself, versus the inventory that we're doing. That's not good. That's not good. And of course, in Brazil, we have notarized documentation. Whenever you submit something for a court case, you not only have the physical evidence, you have to go to a notary, pay him a big whacking pile of money, and he produces a notary document that says, you know, blah, 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 all the stuff that's there. <laughs> all right. It's expensive. We're talking like, you know, it's 300 bucks per yeah. notary document. Okay, it's not trivial. Uh, basically, once I see this, uh, it's not good, right? Let's say we're like, well, we need to look at all the evidence now, right? Because, you know, discrepancies happen. People make mistakes. But when we see this type of scale, it makes us wonder if there's a bigger problem. So, oops, what do we see? When we look at the 24 images, right? Vendor 1 actually had a more or less decent methodology. They would put one image on one physical hard drive stored separately, right? That's, that's a good way to do it. Well, first of all, we have five images where there is a discrepancy between the physical label versus serial number. Okay, not super bad, but not good. Three of, the, three of the images show a mismatch versus notarized evidence. This is, this is much less good, right? Because the notarized evidence is officially in the court documents. Mm -hmm. 10 of the images show post-acquisition modification. In other words, we know when the data was acquired, we know what it was acquired from, but we see access times after the acquisition date, right? So the dates on the images are now different. Could, could that just be the files originally had a modification date in the future? No. No. That, I mean, that shouldn't happen, right? Unless somebody goes in and tampers with it. Right. And more importantly, if, if something like that had occurred, they should have written it down, right? I mean, when you acquire an image and it's in, you know, in the future or you know, some really bizarre time, there should be a note somewhere. So, but you know, okay, right? This access times, it's not a super bad thing. It's, it's, it's a sign of something bad, though, right? But size differences, that's definitely bad. <laughs> All right. We see two images with the same name with different sizes on different machines because, of course, they weren't that clean about their methodology. And, of course, we see things like file folders, file folders added. They were running end case on these, and some of them would actually write the end case onto the, 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 the image. It's a big no-no. <laughs> big no-no. <laughs> and, of course, the worst part, MD5 changes. All right? So the notarized documentation has the MD5 hashes of all of these images and some of them show different numbers because they are actually opening them. And by the way, you've used NCase, you use NCase, right? When you open NCase, in order to do this, you have to overwrite several commands. Okay? It's not like, like oops, I you know, made it read, read, write, right? In order for this to happen, you actually have to go through a chain of several steps to sure? say, are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Exactly, exactly. Super bad, okay? This is, this is like clown bad. Um, <laughs> yes, right. This is all coming into us. Uh, and of course, even better, not all the images are full images. Some of them are just file system only. And this comes into play later on. So it's not good. It's not good. Chain of custody obviously is broken, at least in a few of these. All right? So at this point, we're like, it's time to get medieval on your ass. <laughs> So we have no confidence whatsoever in what happened before. It is time to really look closely at what's going on. So we review the full evidence. And by the way, this is the evidence set that was already submitted to the police and to the court. All right, so this is coming in after, after this is already on the record, so to speak. Vendor 1 acquisition. They were charged with getting the WordPress blog. 
Well, they didn't actually capture the blog contents. They didn't actually capture the style, the code, the code comments of the website. They did take it down. So all we have is a literal screenshot image of the WordPress site. <laughs> uh, not good. Now, the data that was pulled off the site, even better, okay? We had just been taking it, you know, as is, like not making any judgments, all right? What we find out when we look closer, PDFs that were leaked on the WordPress site were not only not saved, they were printed into a new PDF file. Okay, why is this bad? All metadata is gone. Everything, all right? Office files, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoints are also printed into PDF. Same problem, right? All metadata is gone. Even images, even pictures that were leaked were saved and were printed into a new file. So, you know, it's like these guys were deliberately trying to hide something. They were, it's like, if, if you wanted to physically destroy the evidence, like, you couldn't do a more thorough job than what, what this is. Okay. Twitter. Only one screenshot was taken of each tweet. And there were hundreds and hundreds of them. <coughs> Why is this a problem? Well, you know, although there wasn't a huge amount of traffic, there were likes and retweets. Didn't capture any of that. We have no idea who was liking or retweeting these. We also don't have any idea of whether the tweet targets were investigated in any way. Right? We just see some names. And of course, you know, we're coming to this three years in the, in the past, a little tough at this point. Oh, three years, because I was going to say, it was recent, but yeah. really less public, so three years. Except the company, Vendor One, had been taking them down. Right? Both the WordPress and the Twitter account are gone. They've been deleted already. Archive.org? I'm sorry? Archive.org? I mean, honestly speaking, if we really want to, we could go to Twitter, and they do have a store somewhere. Right. But the point is, we, it shouldn't be necessary to have to resort to those measures for something as straightforward as you know, showing the code and taking a screenshot of that. <laughs> All right, so how far does it go? Look, we now look at the leak data, OK? There were 57 total leaks. Right? So this was a month-long campaign. This was not like a minor thing. A month-long campaign where literally almost every day something new was coming out, tweets were going out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, actual unique leaks were only 37, so whoever was doing the leaking was re redoing, reusing some of the data. Actual unique files leaked, 172. Right? There were some archives there which contained a whole pile of data. So we find more evidence, more errors. This is a zip file of one of the archives. Okay? Obviously, I've cleaned it up to you know, protect, protect the innocent. Mm -hmm. But uh, comprovante are payments. Uh, Swift are actual records of Swift transfers. These are transfers to individuals. That's fine, right? You can and these these dates are before the leak incident. What the hell is this? Vendor one evidently opened this archive, was editing these files, and then resaved the zip file and left the temporaries up. Well, how do we know? Well, if we look into this data, we actually see the names of the guy who did it. <laughs> right. So we know who did it. So these are all these temporary files. Whenever you create a, you know, a, a, an office document, it creates a temporary file, and if you're not careful, it gets sa sa saved, right? Mm -hmm. So he, he really holds this up that, right? Because A, evidence of it. Evidence of evidence tampering. B, the data has changed. This date is towards the end of the leak period, so this was ongoing, right? We don't actually know now anything about the original zip file this came from. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Just <laughs> killed this branch of the investigation, pretty dead, right? We actually found this directory and found almost all of these files. So we know what the original <laughs> files were, but the actual evidence, we don't, have the, we don't have the WordPress site, we don't have the original files anymore, nothing. It's, it's a disaster. Uh, more good stuff, more egregious errors. So, this, so the same vendor in a different zip file, he actually renamed the files. How do we know? We actually found the source files, right? Because as we, were, we actually found the source files. These are the actual source files, again, cleaned up, protecting this in. These were what were in the evidence. How do we know? Well, once again, we, we have his fingerprints there, right? We have the names of the guys who did this. What the fuck? <laughs> like seriously, right? We're in Brazil, why are they renaming this into English? 
No, I mean, really, why? Why would you rename this English? Right? Why would you rename it period? This is supposed to be evidence. Uh, you know, and again, you know, we know that they're correct because we found the original files and the actual, you know, the, the name changes don't affect the MD5. All right, so the files MD5 match is what we found. But this, this, this lost us a week. Right? Because, oh, English, that means our attacker must be an English speaker. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> or maybe, but we will never know, right? All right, so, long story short, 10 guys on site for a year. Judge throws out all the digital evidence. All of it. So you can imagine how happy the customer is. He's just paid for 10 big four consultancy guys on site for a year. He's thrown a guy in jail for four months. All the evidence against him has to be thrown out on the digital side. More fun, vendor two. Right? Now that we've done putting down vendor one, let's take a look at vendor two. I mean, how bad can it get? Well, can't really read it here, but their job was to go out and find further leaks, right? whether from the same source or other. Right? The festival was burned, they want to make sure it didn't happen again. One of the examples is, this is a Google example right? that I put in there, but the actual example was a Yahoo example. Okay? And essentially, it was an archive. Okay? Not an archive, but an actual directory. So if you were to cut off the back end of this link, and you were to put the rest of it in there, you would actually see the directory where it all came from. There could be all these files there. And in this, in this particular case, what happened was there were some large files that were very hard to move via email. And so these guys, you know, someone in the company was creating an outside directory that he could dump the files to on the internet and someone else could access it that way. Right? It was actually, actually a non-attack, you know, non just someone being stupid. But because they never did this, they thought it was one file. <laughs> It was actually 35 files. Very poor job. Uh, and of course, you know, we know this because you know they found that one file because it had a keyword in it that was the company name. None of the other 34 files had the company name. So of course, all they found was this. Oops. Uh, second thing they did, which was actually a good idea, right? This is about the time the LinkedIn leak came out. They had a bright idea. Let's look and see if. Uh, company people were in that LinkedIn database and were using, reusing the same passwords in their corporate stuff. It's a good idea, actually, right? Well, the problem is, one, these guys did not use a clean Bitcoin. So, what's that? Tracked back. Yes, there are a lot of ways that you can look at uh, the Bitcoins that were used and to see who else is using it. And, you know, when, you, when, when a corporation is buying Bitcoins, that went through terrorist and drug dealer hands. <laughs> the corporate legal people don't like it. <laughs> right? So they were not using clean Bitcoin. But more importantly, they weren't doing any kind of operational security. They, they actually asked this, the, the owner of this data for only the email addresses associated with their company. Thank you. You just highlighted that this is important and I'm willing to pay thousands of dollars for it. Hey, ha hack me now, right? <laughs> Bad, bad. Okay. Point is, these are just not, this was a decent idea, right? They did find some data, but both of these examples show a very poor amount of forethought and planning and executing their tasks for the customer. Right. From, from, from our view, this made the problem worse, not better. So lessons learned. Number one, even the biggest names in DFI services can deliver poor results. One of the reasons this happened is because the customer was ignorant. Okay. The vendor obviously screwed up, but one of the reasons they were able to get away with this egregious level of errors is because the customer had no idea what was going on. Right. There were no checks or balances of any kind. There were no checkpoints, nothing. Customers need to have a basic understanding of the digital forensics e-discovery process in order to make sure these bad things don't occur. Okay, of course, ideally you hire a professional to do it, but stuff happens. Practitioners, be professional, right? Don't forget the basics. Document, flows, scope, right? Think about the consequences of your actions. And of course, operational security is not just the term. The last thing the customer needs is for security practitioner to be making more problems. And that's, uh, that's basically it. We're Ventura, we do uh, digital forensics, 
e-discovery and incident response. Questions? How long did it take for you to find all of that? How long did it take? So we started on uh, the middle of February, and we wrapped up in June. So we had uh, three guys on site, so myself and two other people, uh, basically doing the same work that was supposedly done by 10 guys on site for you. So how did you make this huge mistake and not stay for the Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> Well, honestly, uh, you know, again, uh, because somebody was actually put in jail, uh, yeah. So, so what was the, the outcome? So all of these findings then, did they go back? Like, did you guys eventually go back to the court and things correct? So, 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 the, the, where did it so where did it end up was uh, at, at, by the beginning of June, which is when we were wrapping up, okay, we had proposed one more, one last phase. We had actually identified the actual server that all the data came from. Right. So up to this point, we had just been looking at data. With the access to internal information, we had narrowed it down to the point where, because the leaked data wasn't random, right? The leaked data, uh, a lot of it was, um, was scanned images, honestly, right? So we would see versions of it, like the source, uh, Excel, uh, source office documents. Uh, we would see actual like, uh, intermediate versions where like, some agreement was signed by the CEO but not by anybody else but we would actually see the full agreement signed by all the parties in the leaked documents. So this gave us a very good idea of where the actual attack point came from. We had identified the actual server that did it, okay? That we're, you know, 90% sure. So we had proposed another project to, to you know, process that server and, and find out once and for all. The problem is, again, the, the, the whole case has been going on for a couple years plus, right? Um, the original suspect was not actually even in the company when the leaks happened, okay? So he was an IT guy that switched over to the finance department and due to a discrepancy with his resume was fired, all right? So he was already out of the company before the leaks even occurred. But everyone would point fingers at him and said he was the one. And he was the one that got thrown in jail for four months, pretty much at the word of the company, all right? So you can see this is just a shitstorm, right? This is a guy that's been in, in jail in Brazil for four months and in our opinion, was probably not the guy who did it. Okay, so most likely, the reason the company decided not to go further is because a the, the CEO's job has already been resolved, right? He's still in it, and b if the further we dig, the more likely we're going to produce evidence that they put the wrong guy in jail. So that's where we wound up. But of course, there's a gigantic lawsuit going on between the company and Vendor One. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's not happy yeah. Yeah. because because vendor one obviously does all the other stuff right they do their accounting and yeah, they do everything. So I mean I was actually in the room when the CEO of our customer called the CEO of the support consultancy in Brazil and he and the secretary answers and says you know mr. so-and-so is in a meeting right now um, can, can he call you back and the, and the CEO is like customer CEO is like you need to walk into that room, and you need to tell Mr. So-and-so that this is Mr. So-and-so calling, and if he doesn't call me back in five minutes, you're going to lose your job. <laughs> it was like that, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's going to be rolling around for a while, and you know, I don't know when it's going to get wrong, but it's just ugly all around, right? And, but all of this occurred because of, again, a whole series of mistakes. Is, is this and the way is this just on vendor one not experienced analysts doing this stuff and mistakes? Or is there thing, like is there data to point to malintent or part of vendor one? So, you know, obviously we're not the right people yeah. to judge a competitor. Uh, what we can say though is that uh, one of the fingerprints on the documents is the head of the division in Brazil. So it's not a random dude. Right? So we, 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 you know, this is a big customer, they're very important. Right. It's, it's not like, you know, some new guy was hired and thrown in there and he just wasn't clueless. So I don't know what happened, right? Again, we're not, we're not, a, a lot of this was pulled out over time, right? We were only given little bits and the more we dug, the, the you know, the bigger hole became. But it, it's just bad. Right? It's just a very poor uh, example of, or I should say a very good example of what not to do. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, when you're doing an investigation like this in general, uh, how much would you say is like done by automated tools versus like manual digging through things? So uh, if you look at this particular project in phases, right? So we had a first phase where we first brought in for the digital discovery. Um, you know, the e-discovery the e bit that we were first brought in for, which is not even in this phase, right? This was like in January of this year. That was probably, it was probably 60% tools and 40% report writing, right? Because in this case, all we're doing is gathering evidence, right? Show me all the examples of uh, IP that was, uh, you know, in the leaked documents, right? Which is keyword searches and stuff like that. Right, and then the rest, of course, is you know doing the report. Once we got into an investigation, then the tool bit becomes a less of an issue. We still run it, but it's a one-time run. Right, we run the tools to do all the you know extraction of various data. That was probably around 10, 15 percent of the, the, the hours spent, although not billable hours. Right, so for us, you know, we kick off the runs, we go, we leave, and come back in a couple of days. Right, there's no point billing you know our rate for <laughs> for machines running tools. Right. So, but basically, as you get further and further down, right, once you've extracted the data you need to extract from there, then a lot of it is, is manual work, right? So, for example, um, you know, some of the leaked documents were only findable by digging through email, right? So, you know, from the tools, for example, you can see timelines, right? Um, we know roughly, because of the subject matter, almost exactly when the timeline was for one set of documents, because you know the, the financial payment stuff. We knew exactly what that timeline was. And from there, we can use the tools to, to give us all the you know, emails and so forth in that point. But then to actually go through that and find the right one requires a human, right? And in this particular case, the, uh, the origin of these documents was encrypting the data, right? which is another interesting piece of evidence, right? The leaked data was actually encrypted Although the unlocked password was in another email right beside it. <laughs> but we actually see the actual document. We actually know exactly where it came from. Uh, but it was not the version that was stored. Uh, you know, probably on server. Version? What's that? The English version. Uh, I mean, the language of money, right? <laughs> so yes, uh, although this was in Brazil, this, the company standardizes on English internally. Uh, so all their documents are, all other legal documents are in English. But, you know, Google Translate worked pretty well. Except for some little cases like uh, trivia. The word legal, which sounds like legal, it just means cool. <laughs> In Portuguese, that confused me for a while. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, it's very good. The uh, Vendor One is a big four international consultancy. With a large division of the zone. Correct, correct. Right. Right. Vendor 2 is a Brazilian company. Okay. Right. So, with the egregious errors of the first two measures, was there ever anything done against them? And I guess, follow up question if not, would that have been different if it was in country? Uh, so, so, the short answer is because this happened this year, the repercussions are still rolling. Uh -huh. What they're going to wind up being, nobody knows. Okay. But is it, is it from like the company asking for their money back, or is it more like a legal thing, you know, like where? Oh, you, you mean is there going to be a criminal consequence of that? Yes. Yeah. 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 So I, I think the, sh the short answer is if they wanted to, they could possibly do something. But in reality, the, the customer doesn't have, doesn't have any interest in making this any noisier than need to be. They kind of want this to go yeah, away. Right. But but the, the, because it's a big four consultancy, this is not the only thing they do, right? right. So the big four consultancies they do accounting, they do you know all that, mm -hmm. and so you know the, the whole ball is kind of complicated. I imagine the customer, you know, whatever uh, company that has to reach, would at least want their money back. Oh, it, that will be the very least of yeah, so the consequences. Yeah, I guess just trying to figure out is that the least if it is. So, so as I said, the reason it's complicated because is because of the legal case, right? Yeah. So, legal case, the guy's in jail, was in jail for four months. There is some question of what happens if you make too much noise over that, right? That because if he wasn't the actual I'm guy, sure we got a check. I'm sure we got a check. Yeah. <laughs> it's very complicated. Very complicated. Very ugly. Right. All, all I can say is that big four consultancy, um, 
you know, that this customer owns their butt. Like, I mean, it's bad. It's very bad. How do they find them? How do they find you? Uh, essentially through a referral through the police. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So the CEO of our company, Domingo Montanaro, he, ha he has a, you know, he has a 15 year history in Brazil uh, for doing e discovery and digital forensics. They called him in. It took him a year. <laughs> Well, again, oh, yeah. we weren't called in to find all this, right? Yeah. <laughs> we were just called in to document this case and prepare a nice report for, the, for them to throw the book at this first law. Yeah. Any other questions? Interesting. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. So Hopefully, we can move it Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, so, you could just want in to do this documentation of the entire case and then want to like, getting a point of evidence or picking up these things for a lot of digital. So, so what we were asked to do was to attribute, to, to build the actual case against the individual, looking at the leaked data versus what evidence we had in hand, right? So yes, we weren't asked to find those with some mistakes. But the thing is, when you go through and you see this kind of mistake there, so we document it because we don't want the fire to be lit on our ass. <laughs> right. And so, you know, all of what you see here, we didn't even really talk about until our final report after the second case. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if we were to bring it up front, it looks like we're just trying to make more business for ourselves, which we're really not. In this case, we just wanted the customer to be aware that their whole legal team, their whole direction that they've been going on is, is a little shaky. Um, but, you know, that wasn't our chart. It's just when evidence starts coming in, and it's, as you see, you have to. You have to protect yourself. I'm going to see if there's any questions online for a minute, guys, because we are streaming this. And then. And I don't think I can. <laughs> so there's no questions, I guess. <laughs> uh, we assume there's no questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, or do you make any 